say, well, I got a bill due, and I don't have no way of paying it. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask to think, according to the power of the us. God bless you. You can be seated tonight. Amen. Thankful that you are here in the house of the Lord. Amen. Worshiping on a Wednesday night Bible study. I want to just say thank you to everyone that came to prayer last night. I promise you prayer is what's going to take us to that next level of revival and harvest. Amen. And I'm very thankful. Amen. For all of those that came uh, and prayed last night. Now, I want to uh, uh, just let the church know um, how many drove in the parking lot tonight here in the back. Now, how many of you felt like you were driving a four-wheel drive car? How many has ever hit a pothole back here before? Anybody drive over the potholes tonight and see they weren't there? So you didn't even know. A gentleman came by today that uh, came by many years ago and put some patches. And uh, because uh, I, I pastor's been looking at... Uh, doing some wanting to fix the parking lot amen we need to fix it amen uh and i'm just i'm telling you all that to, uh and I'll, I'll i'll address this in the business meeting and then hopefully there'll be more folks but if not that's fine uh but to do it what they call a chip and seal which is really not something i really want to do is about seventeen thousand, and then to do some hot, uh, hot asphalt on top of what's already there uh, would be about 25 to thirty thousand. just letting y'all know where we live in this day and age so this gentleman come by today, and he had a, a truck, and he had product in the back, and, and he said, I noticed you got some potholes in your parking lot, and I came here many years ago and, and fixed several. He says, uh, I can fix your pothole. I said, go ahead. He, he priced it to me at $550, and uh, uh, look, there's some craters back there. So I'm telling you that to tell you this. Would you pray with me? And then this Sunday, I'd like to take up an offering. Amen to uh, uh, to take care of that need and uh, what offering comes in I'll put it towards it and if it's not enough then pastor will do the rest and because I felt like it was something we really needed to take care of before somebody loses a car in a pothole <laughs> amen and uh, you know the needs five hundred and fifty dollars now there's still a few more out there and he told me for about another four hundred and fifty dollars he'd come back and, and and do another load and finish off the rest of them so if we get, you know, the more finances, I'll probably have him come back just to go ahead and patch. Because right now it's not in our budget. $25,000, $30,000 not in our budget. And uh, uh, I'm just being truthful with the church. And uh, I will tell you this, if we wanted to, we could go to the bank. And uh, they would be more than glad to, uh, to lend us that. We have good, we got good credit in this town. We got a good name in this town. And that's due to you folks. So that's because y'all have always met your obligations. But I don't want to get the church in that kind of strain right now. Amen. Uh, we don't know which way the economy's going. And, and, uh, and I know that he, he's got a neat little machine and it smoothed it right out, made it level with everything else. And uh, so uh, that's what we did today. And uh, I thank you. I thought you would appreciate it. Um, I sure don't want to replace somebody's suspension on a car. So uh, so pray with me about that this Sunday. Uh, we'll do that. We want to make sure everybody gets an opportunity to be blessed. And uh, so I just bring that need to the church tonight, and I know that you will help me. Y'all is always faithful, and I'm so thankful. You know, I really am thankful. And uh, I'm on a preacher's forum, and, uh, you know, we talk about all kinds of stuff. We mainly just pick at each other and remind each other that we're human, you know, and so get off your high horse preacher uh and uh and we talk about churches and stuff and different scenarios i mean that's what ministers do you know peers amongst each other and someone was talking about something the other day and i just put on there boy y'all make me so thankful for my church <laughs> i really am i'm very thankful for peace tabernacle you're a pleasure to pastor and uh, you know i'm thankful today i just want you to know that God allowed me to come this direction 
And I'll always be indebted to Brother Fisher for giving me the opportunity, amen, first to come and preach for him, amen, and then to build that relationship over many years that led to me pastoring. So I want to thank the Lord for that. But we want to turn to the book of Revelations, the second chapter. Amen. Now, I'm always uh, trying to help uh, you find good preaching. I know you're like me on the computer. Um, I'm always trying to give folks good stuff to uh, listen to or, or uh, you know, get on. How many's ever heard of Because of the Times? Because of the Times is a conference they have in Louisiana, and uh, it's for ministers. And my wife is taking the kids back tonight. So, amen. So they can go ahead and be dismissed. Um, and uh, I found a treasure trove today on YouTube. Uh, I was looking for some preaching. I wanted to hear Brother Urshan preach, Elder Brother Urshan. And I just, just something about sometimes I get these longings to hear the old voices of the past. And I came upon a message he preached, uh, and then I found a whole treasure trove of Because of the Times. Uh, you can get on YouTube, type in Because of the Times. Brother Kilgore's on there. Brother Urshan's on there. Brother Becton's on there. Brother Chester Wright in his younger days was on there. So I know y'all love Brother Wright. And uh, so there's just a, I mean, from 1986 on up to today, I mean, there's just Johnny James, they call him the walking Bible. He's another brother bear. He just gets up and he just don't even take a pulpit, a Bible to the pulpit. And he just begins to go through and, and preach scripture. So uh, anyhow, I just, maybe you're like me. I like to, uh, sometimes at the house, I just like to have church, you know. And, uh, I, I, you know, when you're feeding folks constantly, you, you want to get fed. And that's how I've always done it. So anyway, just wanted to share that with you. Revelations, the second chapter. And the word of God reads, under, under the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in the right hand, in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and howest thou cannot bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. And has borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. We're going to talk about, we're going to start tonight on the churches in Revelations. And uh, tonight we're going to talk about Ephesus. Lord Jesus, I thank you tonight for what you're going to do in the midst of your people, giving us a greater understanding of who and what you are. And I believe tonight, God, there's going to be clarification on the church and our role and the roads that can lead us down. And we thank you for that tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, can the church say amen? God bless you. You can be seated. Precious Lamb of God. Now, I want to... Uh, bring to your understanding the next few weeks we're going to be talking about the different churches i'm not in a hurry to get through uh, all this teaching on prophecy now we started last year and i hope that you have kept up with it from to some extent i didn't want to just jump into the churches right in the middle of the holiday season amen because i want to be able to just continually continue to keep going on um and so with that being said i want to start with the church in ephesus now each church needed a particular message and the spiritual state of each church corresponded precisely to the exhortation that was given so the individual churches illustrated conditions that are common in the local churches amen at that time as well as throughout history the message to the seven churches therefore include instruction that is applicable for churches uh, in today's society and so 
Amen. There are, there are many different types of spiritual needs. So along with the messages to the churches were the exhortations, which are, are personal in character, including instruction and warning to the individual Christian. And so uh, we can look at these churches and we can see uh, in ourselves some application. Because not only does the application affect the church of that time, it's also obvious that, amen, the seven churches represents the chronological development of church history viewed spiritually. Now I want to say that again. That the seven churches represent the chronological development of church history viewed spiritually. There is a progression of evil climaxing in Laodicea. However, it's obvious that every detail of the messages addressed to these particular churches is not necessarily fulfilled in succeeding periods of church history. But God is saying, here's things to watch out for. Here are progressions that can happen in the church that will take you to Laodicea. Amen? Amen. Anybody got any questions? Y'all weren't expecting that, were you? <laughs> Somebody will be after church. Brother Bumgarner, here's all my questions. To each of the epistles of the seven churches, it contains a command to write to the angel of the particular church, a title of the Lord taken, for the most part, from the imagery of the preceding vision. So you have to go back into Revelations 1 to, to, to bring that to clarification. An address to the angel of the church, Introducing a statement of its present circumstances, a prophetic announcement, and a promise to him that overcometh. So those are things that we will see manifested. So we're going to start with the book, uh, second book of Revelations in the church at Ephesus. And Ephesus was the most prominent city in the Roman province of Asia. It already had a, a long history of Christian witness. Paul had ministered there for three years as he was recorded in Acts 19, 23 through 41. We see where the Apostle Paul, amen, had established churches there and, and done an apostolic and evangelistical work. And so when we look into the Scripture, we're not looking at a church uh, that was just formed. It was a church uh, that had been around a while. In fact, Ephesus really applies to many of the churches that are in our day and age today, amen, that have been around for a while. Somebody say praise the Lord. Amen. I'm thankful today. Someone asked me uh, the other day how long uh, pa uh, Peace Tabernacle had been here in this city, and I, I'm, I'm guessing roughly 65 to 70 years. Amen. Boland to Wharton in the 1960s, so that's 50 years. And I think it was established a little bit sooner than that, like maybe in the mid-50s or somewhere along in there. But needless to say, it's been here a long time. And it's had its ups and downs. 1930s? Praise God. So that makes it a lot older than that. So needless to say, there's been truth preached, whether it was two or three or many, here in this city for a long time. In this region, in the Bowling Wharton area. And so, just like our church, the church at Ephesus, amen, was a mature church. And so the Lord begins to speak to them, and he says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, he that walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now, I want to make sure that you, you understand that, uh, that there was something significant uh, when the Lord spoke to the church there. Uh, he, when he identifies the one, he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. you got to understand that the uh, right hand signifies the hand of redemption, the hand of power. So 
uh, when he is speaking, he's identifying. He says, I'm the one that has the power of redemption, of authority. Uh, he uses the Greek word for hold there's kraton, and it means to hold authoritatively. So, amen, that hand of power was there. And the messenger, therefore, amen, says, uh, you know, he's here to help to protect and be in control. Now, I've said this before. This church, amen, the church is a theocracy. And God is in control. Amen. Somebody says, man, I don't want to be a part of a board-run church. Well, you know, that's really not the church. Because the church is run by God. And, you know, we can confuse uh, earthly things with spiritual things. Because the church is a spiritual entity. Amen. Our first and foremost Thoughts about church should be meeting my spiritual need. Getting my spiritual fix. Amen. I'm coming to church to worship and praise God. I'm not coming to, to be a part of any kind of clique. I'm not coming to be a part of anything but uh, what God wants me to be a part of. I'm coming to get my praise on. And the more people come to church wanting to get their praise on, amen, it's hard to look around when you're looking up. Hallelujah. <laughs> and the reason a lot of people get in trouble is because they're looking around too much. But I come to praise God. I come to worship Him. I come to magnify Him. Amen. I, I don't know if I told this church. I think I did a while back. Sometimes I think about, uh, you know, just uh, taking the chairs up here and, and uh, putting them somewhere, maybe letting the praise singer sit on them, and, and I'll just get down on that front row where I can just praise God before I preach. That way I don't have to worry about uh, what's going on behind me. Amen. Because I want to praise God. I want to come hear from the Lord. Amen. And you know, as a pastor, amen, I understand that uh, you, the church is depending on pastor to be in the right mind and in the right spirit. And I know one pastor, amen, pastors in the Houston area, one of his ushers sits outside his office and nobody comes into his office before church. I'm not saying I'm going to do that. I'm just saying that's the way he... But he just doesn't want anything to... He don't want anything to feed into his spirit before he goes in because he knows he's got to minister to the body of believers. Amen. So if you want to tell me something negative or tell me something, wait till after church. Then I'll take it home and go to my prayer closet. Amen. Amen. And let me just take a, uh, a commercial break real quick. Sister Lupe, come up with a wonderful plan. There's a uh, 30 days of prayer chart uh, for 24 hours a day uh, out in the sanctuary, uh, out in the uh, hallway there. Amen. I already signed up. There's a day you can fast if you want to fast. Amen. Begin to pray for revival. I encourage you to sign up. Amen. I'll be pushing that because I really believe in that. And I uh, thank Sister Lupe for doing that. Amen. Now back to the regular scheduled service. So, we're talking about the church in Ephesus. We're talking about a church that was established. Now, Sister Waddy, you don't have to laugh at that. And so, what comes with a maturing church? Now, I'm going somewhere with all this. What comes with a maturing church? Church problems. Every church has them. There's no perfect church been around this all my life amen and so uh, I'm not saying I've seen it all but I've seen a great deal amen and uh, and even as a child you you know and that's the thing don't think your children don't notice what's going on and they hear and you better be careful because you can affect the next generation and one thing I try to do, and I thank you for doing, there's one thing I will commend Peace Tabernacle on doing is you protect my children. And I'm very thankful for that. I really feel that way. And I hope it never changes. Amen. Because I don't want Jonathan and Jordan to grow up not liking the church. I've heard too many, you know, preacher's kids, and I'm not trying to, uh, but, you know, one reason they backslide out of church is because of how... Somebody's took, you know, against their parents or this or that. But you know what? 
uh, I thank you for protecting them. And y'all, you know, Brother McLean told me that uh, when y'all voted me in, really, you know, I may have gotten three or four votes, but my wife got the rest and Jonathan got the majority. <laughs> and since then, Jordan's come along and y'all have just loved, y'all spoil them. I, I thank you. I mean, y'all just love them. And, and that means a lot to me. Because things happen in the church. Whether we want, to, want them to or not. I don't like bad things to happen within the church, but sometimes there are things happen and you've got to deal with them. And, and it's not always pleasant, but when we put a lot of prayer to it, God takes care of it. So back to the church at Ephesus. Here, here the church, uh, amen, we, it's, a, it's a mature church. It's not a church that is just building. It's a church that knows what it believes. First thing that the Lord does is come in and says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how... Thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou that hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. I thank God for a church that's mature enough. Amen. And I have relied on the maturity of this church, and I just feel like, you know, we can give somebody an opportunity, and the church is mature enough to know when somebody's true and when they're not. Amen. We, we're not just a young, youngling church around here. There's some of folks that have been established 20, 30, 40 years in this church. Thankful for that. Amen. So we, we, can, we can try those, and we, we know those that are preaching truth, and we know those, amen, that, that come in, and, and sometimes they're, you know, they're a little off, and you can just say, you know what, we, well, God bless you. Amen. And that's a sign of maturity. That's a sign of maturity. Because you know the doctrine. Or you should know the doctrine. You know, we know what we believe. We know we've got to repent and be baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. We know there's just one God. And His name is Jesus. Amen. We, we're not uh, uh, slack concerning those things. And He says, and has borne and has patience for my name's sake, has labored and has not fainted. Now, so the Lord is saying, you know, Ephesus, you're, you're a church. Uh, uh, he's commending them for appointing that which is morally bad as well as those that are theologically in error. Ephesus, you got a good spirit of discernment. And you have the tenacity to reject those whom should sound false. Amen. And I pray that Peace Tabernacle will have that same unction that's a high point for Ephesus, that we will understand that, uh, you know what, we st it still takes prayer to have revival. It still takes prayer, amen, to see God move. It still takes worship, amen, involved in the church. Church is not a place for you to be entertained, but it is a place for you to be a participant. Too many times we create a church, amen, in this day and age where Amen. It's no different than going to a concert. People aren't worshiping God anymore. Nobody's singing the songs, partly because they don't know them and partly because they can't keep up with what's going on in the screen. But you know what? Uh, I, I don't mind singing the same hymns over and over. You know why? Because repetition, amen, creates memorization. And pretty soon everybody knows the song and we can sing them together and worship together. And I'd rather have a people worshiping together than sitting back being entertained. Hallelujah. You know, we're, we, we don't need to be a generation that's being entertained. We need to be a generation that praises God. Hallelujah. And I know that there are those that uh, we can go round and round and round. And they say, you know, you're going to miss a generation. Well, I believe this, that when that generation comes home, they don't want to come home to smoke and mirrors. They want to come home to what they know is truth when they left. Hallelujah. We got to be a church in this day and age. And I, and I believe that we've got to contend. Jude said we need to contend, amen, for the faith. We've got to contend for what is truth. We've got to contend for what is right. Even in, amen, the midst of other churches, you know, there are those that, amen, are allowing things that they, they used to not allow. And, you know, there's got to be a balance. I understand that. And we live in a modern day and age, and there's things that, we go all around, but we still got to stay true to the principles of holiness and righteousness. Second John 1 and 10 says, If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, 
receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. We've got to be careful how we blur the lines. Ephesus was a church of patience. This is mentioned twice in connection with service and with suffering. One thing God has taught me, and I guess when I was younger, I, I wasn't very patient. But life experiences have a way of creating patience. Perhaps it was fatherhood. Perhaps it was just trials that I've gone through. And I'm not by any means saying uh, I am the most patient individual. But I have learned this, and I've said it before, and I, this is kind of my little mantra, that life is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And living for God's the same way. And sometimes you have to wait on the Lord. Sometimes answered prayers don't come overnight. Amen. He is a sovereign God, and he can do things in his own time, in his own way. Hallelujah. And he knows what's best. That is the hardest lesson for a lot of people to learn, is he knows what's best best amen you know he he people say well i don't know if i can believe in god there was a barber one time said i don't believe in god and the man said well why don't you believe in god and he said well you know why does all this bad stuff happen some of y'all may know what i'm talking about might have even seen it why is all this bad thing happening if there's a god why is he letting all this happen so if all this bad stuff happening, there must not be any God. I kind of confounded the Christian man there, and he stepped out of the barber shop. And when he did, he looked over, and there was this hippie-looking boy. Had hair down the middle of his back, and, and uh, he kind of smiled for a minute and, and uh, took the young man back in and, and said, You know what? I don't think there's a barber. There's no such thing as barber. And the man said, You're crazy. I'm a barber. He said, no, there can't be no barber. Otherwise, this guy wouldn't have long hair. And the barber said, well, the only reason he don't have his long hair is because he won't come in and get a haircut. And the man that says, that's exactly right. The reason why there's so much suffering and hurting in the world is because people won't come to God. You can't force the long-haired hippie to get a haircut. You can't force him to go to the barber. And we can't, God doesn't force people to come to him, but whomsoever will. Amen. And you know what? You have to be patient sometimes and realize there is a God. And just because your situation is not going as quickly as you want it to change or, or your, your answer hasn't come right when you want him. The thing is, is the psalmist said it best or the proverb said it best, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not to your own understanding. But in all thy ways acknowledge him. And he will direct thy path. Amen. Sometimes in our suffering. We have to have patience. Another thing that. The, Nicol the, the, the church at Ephesus had. They, they hated the work. Of the Nicolaitans. And the Nicolaitans were led. By a man who had. Been a proselyte to Judaism. And then from Judaism. Amen. He come into the uh, revelation of truth. Uh, but in his understanding of truth, he, he seemed to be one of these uh, ones that uh, kind of just moved through one thing to another. And, and you get caught up in this fad and that fad. And there are those, uh, amen, that can come in for a little while, but then they want to try to change things. And the Nicolaitans were were ones that would say it doesn't take uh, all that anymore. In fact, uh, you might even call them the modern-day charismatics uh, because, uh, you know, they, they, they said, well, it don't take all that. You know, when I hear somebody tell me, well, I don't believe it takes all that, automatically a red flag goes up in my spirit. Uh, when they say it doesn't take holiness anymore, there's a red flag that goes up in my spirit. And when somebody says, well, I don't think God requires of that, us, we're under grace. You're only under grace once you've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. If God's ever given me a revelation, he gave me that revelation. You cannot come into grace until you go through the blood. So there is no grace until you're under the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. And that's why baptism is so important, being baptized in Jesus' name. 
You got to have the name. You can't have the grace of the Father till you got his name. I don't know why I keep bringing that up, but I just feel very strongly. I got to tell somebody, you know, it's not in a title. Hallelujah. It's in his name. I understand his identification as father. I understand his identification as son. I understand his identification as the Holy Ghost. But I know these three are one. Amen. Amen. I, you know, and, I, and I, just to be honest with you, amen, I don't catch myself. I don't even pray Father God. I don't. Jesus said I come in my Father's name. So when I address him, I address him as Lord Jesus. I know your name now. I know who you are. There's an identification. Not just a title. Amen. I mean, you know, it would be like Brother Manuel, you know, loopy wife. Wife loopy. Would you cook me some dinner? Wife loopy, I want to thank you for cooking me this dinner. Wife loopy, I want to thank you for, for doing my laundry. That's how we talk to the Lord many times. That's the way the world does because they are separating his identity. Amen. So, his name is Jesus. There is power and authority in the name of Jesus. Amen. There's no other name given unto men whereby we must be saved than the name of Jesus. Amen. That's why this preacher will never baptize in the title Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Jesus said, go ye therefore into all nations, teaching them, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The name of. Which is Jesus. I don't know why I got on that candy stick, but I did. But the Nicolaitans, they, they desired to come in to, to the church. And, amen, they began to say, you know, it doesn't take all that. It doesn't, you know, in that same spirit in the, in the church today, you know, we don't pray as much as we used to pray. And we don't fast as much as we used to fast. And we become very uh, laid back in, in, our, in our being and you know what, uh, uh, it gets to the place where, hey amen, you know, my salvation is only predicated that I come to church on Sunday morning or sometimes on Sunday night. And, and the love of God, amen, amen, is not as strong as it should be. I'm not going to say that it's not there, but the, the church in Ephesus, you know, amen, they, they didn't like that spirit. Psalms. 139 and 21 says, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Something Brother, Brother Urshan said today. He says, you know, as a pastor, and as I have people come up to me all the time, and as a superintendent at the time, he was the general superintendent, and, and uh, he said people come up to me and they and they, and, they, and they say, Brother Urshan, I want you to pray uh, the will of God for my life. I need to know the, what the will of God is. And he says, the Lord explained something to me very clearly. The first thing to do if you're going to be in the will of God is be obedient to his word. And he says, what people are saying is, I want to be in the will of God. What you're saying is, well, I, I want to do something great for the Lord. I want to be used for the Lord. But the first thing to do to be in the will of God is to be in obedience to his word. God has never used anyone that was not in obedience to his word. Now, don't take that out of context. You say, well, I know this one fell over here or that one fell over here, you know. But at some point, he was obedient to the word of God. And through his gift, God raised him up. And the problem with, and the elder even gave warning to this, when God raises you up, you better stay in the will of God, which is being obedience to the word of God. Because when you get out of the will of God, even when you've been raised up, amen, the higher you rise, the longer the fall is. Just a thought. And so 
you know, we, we have to contend for the truth and, and know that the, the will of God is for us to be in obedience with His Word and to live what the Bible says. And so Ephesus, amen, they were commended. That was, amen, they, that was their, their, their uh, uh, thing. Boy, they, they, they valued the truth. But their condemnation was this, that they had left their first love. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember there from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. God said, you departed. You've left. Though it wasn't completely from the love of God. Their love no longer had the fervency, the depth, or the meaning it once had in the church. Note the word is left, not lost. And so, to love lies in the power of the will. I preached it before especially in, in my marriage counseling, that love is a choice. Loving somebody is in the power of the will. There's sometimes there's good days, and sometimes there's bad days. Amen. But you make a choice. I'm going to love them. Amen. Even when I want to kill them. Amen. Someone said that, you know, marriage is like a deck of cards. Starts out with two hearts, but it ends with a club and a spade. I know that wasn't fun. But you know what? You make a decision every day to love that one that you're with. You make a decision every day to put up with their nonsense. Amen. And every one of us, you know, there's things our spouses do that just drive you nuts. But you love them anyway. Amen. Amen. I know there's things I do that aggravate my wife. I know there are. But I'm trying. And when I, when I find out what they are, I try to do better. And when she finds out what bothers me, she tries to do better. Because the, to love is in the power of the will. Now that, That's applying it to, a, to an earthly thing. Amen. But I choose whether I'm going to love you or not. I choose whether I'm going to treat you right or not. I choose whether or not I'm going to talk about you. Well, praise God. We, you have the power to love somebody or judge somebody. You have the power to lift them up or pull them down. And so, you have the power to serve God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, or to do it half-heartedly. And if there's a problem with an established church, is that we, and I'm now, I'm going to get down on the degree now, is that we tend to just do it half heartedly. Amen. There's a rule that 10 to 15% of the church does 90% of the work. Well, praise God, now it's getting quiet. Go back to preaching about being fervent about the doctrine, brother Bumgarner. We know the truth around here. We'll stick with it. But the truth is, is sometimes. Uh, if, if they've lost something, was a fervency. Remember back to when you first, amen, got in the church. You couldn't wait to get to prayer. You couldn't wait to get into the presence of God. Amen. When you had never experienced the Holy Ghost before, and when you experience, I don't care what drug you've ever tried or what alcohol you've ever gotten drunk on, there's nothing like the power of the Holy Ghost. And the beauty of it is, there is no depth uh, to that spirit. Uh, you can't go deep enough into the Holy Ghost. Uh, amen. Many times when we receive the Holy Ghost, you just scratching the surface. Uh, amen. Uh, I remember as a teenager, God filling me, amen, uh, again with the Holy Ghost. I received it the first time when I was 10 years old uh, at a camp meeting. I can recall about 12, 13 years of age, man, getting another dose of it. Uh, amen. And speaking in tongues. Couldn't even talk English. Uh, amen. At a camp meeting, trying to go order food, speaking in tongues. 
Amen. It just gets better and better and sweeter and sweeter. Amen. You know what I was praying? I'm going to tell you something. I'll confess. Pastor, go and confess. Pastor, confession. Amen. Last night at prayer meeting, Sister uh, Lupe, I was praying, God, I want to I wanna renew it in the Holy Ghost. You say, Brother Baumgartner, did you lose your, I didn't lose my Holy Ghost. But I'm saying, Lord, I want to get back so deep in the Holy Ghost that it felt like the first time I ever received it. Amen. That I had no control of my senses. That I had no control of who I was. I didn't know where I was. I didn't care where I was at. I want to be like that young man at the camp meeting when I was a teenager. Four of us had to haul him back to the dorm. And all through the night, he spoke in tongues. And when he woke up, he didn't even know where he was at. I'm talking about the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about when you first got in church. Amen. You were at the church Sunday morning, Sunday night. Amen. They didn't have to beg you to come and pray. They didn't have to beg you to come be involved. They didn't have to beg you to try. Amen. You wanted to do it. You desired to serve God with all your heart. You desire. You weren't too tired. Hey! Take me back, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. I'm going somewhere. Amen, brother. Brother, uh, I got to go visit with Bishop McLean a few months ago, and uh, his short-term memory is not as good as his long-term memory. He, he, he does real good remembering things that happened a long time ago, but things that happened short-term, he, y'all need to just pray for him. He's, he's dealing with that time in his life. And, and so, but he remembers way back when. And, and he, man, he showed me the first deer he ever killed, and, oh, he had the stories of the past, you know. And he got to talking about it. He said, yeah, when, when my wife and I were young people, he said, you know, my dad had this old truck. An old flatbed truck. And they had built these benches. Or this thing that would attach to the bed. And, and uh, he said my dad would pull underneath this thing. And lower that thing down. There was a bench on this side. And a bench on this side. And some chairs. And all the young people would haul, haul, uh, pile in the back of the truck. And go to church. In the back of the truck. Young people. Going to church in the middle of summer when it's 100 degrees in Texas. Having worked all day in the field. Having worked all day around town and crawling in the back of an old dirty truck. I promise you, if I was to offer that to some of ours, I ain't getting up in there. Mess up my hair. Well, Brother Bumgarner, that's just not safe. I just want to know, when did we become a, a nation of tender ninnies? Just a thought. <laughs> they used to go to church, amen, when it was cold, when it was hot, when they'd worked all day. They went early, amen. Brother McLean talked about going to a revival and, and suffering from, when God filled him with the Holy Ghost, God healed him. Amen. Of a disease in his body. Amen. And you know what? He's never been the same since. But he talked all the way home in the back of the truck. You know, I'm talking about getting a fervency like we used to have. And if Ephesus lost something was that fervency of love that they had for God in the beginning. And the thing about a mature church is, is you can learn what to do and what not to do. You can learn how to dress the right part. You can learn how to say the right things. And you can learn, amen, how to go through the motions. Uh, but when you're on fire for God, there's, there's, no, there's no faking it. And when you're on fire for God, amen, you are, you're focused on, i got to get more of the Lord. i got to get more of the Lord. I'm in love with Jesus. And so, what happens in a mature church is you begin to have multiple generations. And the generation that comes after the generation that began doesn't understand the cause. Somebody said, Brother Bumgarner, you're just no throwback. You know, you, you, don't, you don't appreciate this modern day and age of thinking. Amen. And I, I tell every one of these guys that are trying to fix, change things up, I said, you're forgetting the cost. 
When I was a younger minister, I got a hold of every book I could get on on those that established this thing. It was a love of mine. I love history anyway. But I love reading about Brother Bean. And I love reading about, uh, amen, Brother Gleason. And, and those that came before, Brother, uh, uh, you know, those that established the United Pentecostal Church and back before that. I love the story of G.T. Hay. G.T. Haywood wrote, I see a crimson stream of blood. He and Brother Andrew Urshan were great friends. That was N.A. Urshan's dad. And Brother G.T. Haywood, after church one Sunday, said, I just told his wife to go home and I got to go to my office. And he went in his office and he locked the door. And he didn't open the door for a week. And his wife would try to bring him food. And he didn't. He prayed and fasted for a week in his office. And when he came out, amen, he went to the pulpit and he began to sing, I see a crimson stream of blood amen that challenged this young man you better get a hold of god son if you're going to get anything amen when i read about brother kilgore's father and how he started churches amen in old brush arbors amen in the middle of nowhere and nobody would come but he would pray and he felt like giving up but then god would send him to pray at a certain spot and the town drunk prays through and becomes the catalyst for the revival in that city that fired me up and one thing i don't want to lose is Amen. The fervency that the first generation had. The first generation knows what they came out of. Amen. I, I'm thankful to be where I'm at today. I'm thankful that my, my great-grandparents had this truth, and my grandparents had this truth, and my, my parents had this truth, and I'm thankful I have this truth, and I, I'm glad to pass it on to my children. But the thing is, is my children got to have the same fervency that my grandparents had back when God gave it to them, or they'll never make it. And if the, if the church in Ephesus had a problem is, is that that second generation... Though they continued to labor faithfully as those who had gone before them, the intense love for God was missing. And now I can look at the church tonight, and, and I know we're a mature church, but if there's one thing that Ephesus has in common with Peace Tabernacle, I pray it's not this. Uh, I pray that we can't say that those, amen, that gone on before us uh, had a greater fervency for God, a, a more intense love for God than we do. I don't want God to say, uh, amen, Thomas Patterson, uh, amen, I'm glad you're living for God, uh, amen, but your grandmother had a more intense love for me uh, than you do. I don't want God to tell me, preacher boy, I know you're down there in Wharton and you're preaching because I sent you, but your grandmother loved me more than you do. I don't want God God to look at me and tell me that uh, I want God to tell my grandmother now Ruth you love me uh, but you gave something to that boy and he loved me even more than you did uh, you put a fire in that boy's bosom uh, you put some iron in his gut uh, and you let him know uh, you live for God son with all your heart mind soul and strength you give it everything you got don't do it halfway uh, don't do it just in, in, any many any out you know just do it with everything you got and if there's a problem with this generation is we're trying to fake it we're trying to create atmosphere with light show i'll say it i know there's others amen that will tell me you're just off your rocker you can yeah you go ahead and turn the lights off you can have move of god in the dark but you're trying to create an atmosphere with smoke machines and light machines and, and all this modern jazz. And, and you know what? Uh, I'm telling you something. If you're going to create an atmosphere, it better be in a prayer room uh, where the power of God is moving. If you want to create an atmosphere, start doing some fasting and some praying uh, and telling God you love him with everything within you. I'm trying to teach, uh, but there's just too much preaching in the house. Uh, oh, Lord, I'm going to do everything I can uh, to make heaven my home. Uh, I'm going to do everything thing I can uh, to walk the way you want me to walk. Uh, I'm going to do everything I can to live it the way you want me to live it. Because here's the problem. Here's the problem. It's when you get to that place where you're not as fervent as the generation before. It's that cooling, 
becomes a dangerous front runner or forerunner to spiritual apathy. We live in an apathetic age. It's sad. It's sad. I had a pastor friend that's got a larger church. I mentioned his name. You'd know him. We try to record our services, preaching. We try to put it on our website. We've had people visit from Philippines. I don't know where else they visit from, but they go to our, our YouTube Peace Tabernacle page. They watch them there. And I'm okay with that. That way if someone's not here and they need to see what happened, they can get some preaching. Maybe one day we'll do better and even do live stream. But I'm kind of hesitant to do live stream or do our services in real time. Yeah. It was the church where I was at. They were changing some things around and they were, you know, they, they had some cameras and I'm not against cameras. But, but, the, but the statement he made bothered me. Maybe it's just me, you know. Maybe I just need to get over it. He says, you know, the reason why we're doing all this extra camera, we live stream our services on the Internet, and we have three times people watching than that are here. Now, his congregation on Sunday runs about six to 800 people. So what he's telling me, he's got about 1,800 to 2,000 people sitting at home on Sunday watching the service. Now, I know that there are shut-ins. I know that there are those that can't get out and go. I understand that. I respect that. That's one reason I would be for having a live stream. Amen. Wouldn't it be something? Well, I know she can't hear. Amen. But we can put a computer over next door, Sister Husband, and watch Sunday morning church. And she couldn't hear it, but she could definitely see it. I understand. I respect that. But what I have a problem with is if there's that many people, not all of them are invalid at home or shut in. And if you can get up and turn a computer on to watch something on a screen, then you can get dressed and go to church. Now, I, I, that, that, you know, I may get a phone call saying, well, you need to shut that down, boy. Because they're also online giving. But you know what? You can't get your way, give your way into heaven. If you're not giving unto the Lord, you're missing the whole mark anyway. And so, you know, I'm not going to live stream and put a donate here button just because I'm trying to increase offerings. Might make great sense business-wise, but that's not why I come to church. That's not why I pastor a church. I know, I know, I know. I need to hurry on. But what we do, we get apathetic. Well, I don't have to get up and go Sunday morning. Pastor's going to live stream it anyway. I'll just click on and watch it. What a lazy, apathetic spirit. Well, people work. Yeah, I know people work. I'm okay with them watching I'm talking about the ones staying at home because they don't want to get out of bed. Well, we can just live stream. It's hard enough for folks to get here on time anyway. Well, praise God anyhow. I mean, prayer starts at 9.30 Sunday mornings. Some, some folks, I'm just going to, can I teach, talk about it? This is Ephesus. This is Peace Tabernacle. But we get mature, you know, well, I'll get there when I get there, Pastor. Pray on the way. And yet we talk about revival, and we talk about wanting to have a breakthrough, and we talk about uh, wanting God to do great things in our church, but we let that apathetic spirit keep us from getting to prayer. We don't have no problem going other places. We can find plenty of time to do other things. Amen. 
I was thankful for the congregation that was here last night on Tuesday night. But that's still not even half the church. When we get away from that apathetic spirit, Tuesday night prayer meeting is just as important as Wednesday night Bible study. Amen. And Sunday morning and Sunday night are just as, amen, they're not just the most important, but you know what? Wednesday night is just as important as they are. And you're here, so I'm not preaching at you about that. I'm just talking about we've got to get out of that. The devil wants us to get this apathetic, you know, lack of fervency and lack of drive. And, and uh, you know, we just get caught up and, and uh, going through the motions. Amen. We get caught up in, the, in our worship. Our worship is not as fervent as it once was. We've matured. Oh, praise God. We've matured. Hallelujah. Hello. Is that not true? We blame things like our age. Now I know I, I, my most faithful are my seasoned saints. My most faithful are our seasoned saints. My greatest attendees uh, at our watch night service was my seasoned saints. I'm just being truthful. Those that were 60 and older were at our watch night service. You know why? Because I guarantee you, from the time they first got in church, because them old school preachers used to say it, you ain't church, you're going to hell. Huh? That's just the way it was. When I was a little boy, that's the way it was. I mean, I'm teaching like I'm, but there was a fervency about it. And you wanted to be saved. And you wanted to be in the house of God. It was the best thing going. And you weren't caught up in all the things of the world. And everything going on in the world. And you weren't tied down to the things of the world. And everything was focused around church. And I'm going to tell you something. Our children are in the back and they're getting taught something. But I'm going to talk to the parents tonight. If you don't allow your children to be focused around church, you let them be focused around everything in the world, don't be surprised that when they get of age, they don't want to be in church. You focus their attention everywhere else but church. And I teach. They can, they can participate in things. They've got to represent Jesus. But the thing is, is when that becomes more important than living for Jesus, then I've got a problem. And that's one reason, you know, here lately... If, if my little guys, amen, little, they're back there too. You know, Dylan and Elliot, they come in and say, Brother Bumgarner, can we take up an offering? I say, you put your shirt in town. You come to dress the church the way you're supposed to, then you can help with the offering. Because I've just got a burden here recently, Sister Delia. If I don't get my children involved, if I don't get my young people involved, if we don't get them involved in the church and what's going on, and if we don't teach them how to get involved and how to look and how to dress and, and, and make this thing exciting for them, they're not going to want to be a part of it. If we as a church lose our fervency in worship, why should they want to worship? If you sit in a pew, and I know I'm pastoring tonight and and I love you anyway, but if you sit in a pew and don't worship God, don't expect them to worship God. If you praise God like a stiff, they're going to praise God like a stiff. But the only thing I've ever called a stiff was somebody that was dead. Well, when you first received the Holy Ghost, you weren't a stiff. Huh? Hey. Praise God. I still like to worship the Lord. I still like to dance before the Lord. Amen. Praise God. If, if my fingers ain't worshiping him over here or up there or, or doing something else, uh, amen, my I'm going to lift him in my voice. I'm going to lift him in my feet. Amen. I didn't. Amen. I used to have to sneak off to go dancing.
Well, that's the truth. So when I got there, I, I had one thing on my mind. I'm going to dance. I like to dance. I inherited it from my mama. My, my mama can dance, Sister Luffy. When I was a kid, I'm going to tell on her. When I was a kid, you know, my sister Blenda, she would, Sister Alba, she would find these gold noties on the radio on like on Saturday night. And uh, we knew we'd get some of them going. We'd get Mama going. And there was nothing funner than getting Mama going because Mama could dance. I mean, she could do it. She could, she could dance. So she's always been a worshiper in a dance. Amen. Come on now. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, she didn't know it was not wedding. She, she, see, Daddy was a jive player, brother. My daddy played rhythm and blues. Yeah. That R and B sound, you know. You know. Otis Redding, you know. I'm talking that kind of stuff. That's the kind of stuff my mama liked to dance to. She liked to get her groove on. Hey. But I said all that to say this, you know. Because I didn't go there to waste my time. I was going to pay the pearl a great price if I got caught. Because I was taught we don't go to them kind of places, boy. We don't dance that kind of music. If you want to dance, you dance with the Lord. But I love the music. I love to move to the music. And so when I went to those kind of places, I didn't waste my time. Hey, man, I want to find somebody to dance. And when God filled me with the Holy Ghost and put the fire back in me, when I live for God, I don't come to church just to go through the motions. I like to praise Him. I like to worship Him. I've always been someone that likes to worship the Lord. Even if I'm not involved up here, I'm going to be down here worshiping God. Amen. I'm not going to stand there like I ain't moved by the music. Music moves. You move to it. It's a God thing. God created worship. God created the dance. That's why David danced before the Lord. My Lord, he danced so hard, he danced himself out of his clothes. Now, that's some dancing. But really what he was doing is saying, I'm not a king. I'm just a worshiper. These kingly robes don't mean nothing to me. Amen. I would rather worship naked before the Lord and be found unworthy. Amen. Of man's praise than to be found unworthy of his praise. That's what I'm talking about. He had a desire to worship God with everything within him. And when we, when we, if we lose that fervency and we let apathy take over us, then that affects our prayer life. That affects our worship. Amen. That affects our, our being involved in the church. And Amen. And that's why others have to end up doing most of the work. And so if we let those kind of things get a hold of us, but a church that is on revival. Amen. Brother Labus said it right. I, I am a revivalist. I just believe that this thing is if we can pray hard enough and seek God enough and worship Him hard enough. Amen. The Bible says He inhabits the praises of His people. And if I can just praise Him enough. I mean, before you even come in the church tonight, I already had me some praise time. I came in this afternoon and spent about an hour just worshiping and praising God. I don't need you here to praise God. I, I love you. I want you to praise God, too. But I can come in here and have me a praise session all by myself. I felt the Spirit of God come down on me this afternoon. Amen. I said, Lord, it don't get no better than this. I know it does, though, because it just keeps getting sweeter and sweeter. Every time I raise my voice in praise, it just gets a little better. Every time I have a good praise session and I go home and my soles are clo my, my clothes are soaked, amen, from praising God, I can say, man, I have it more. we had some church tonight. Praise God, praise God, praise God.
We've got to get to the place where the church is not entertainment. But church is where God moves. And the only way God moves is through the church. I hope somebody heard that. We don't come to church for the entertainment. But we come for a move of God. And God moves through the church. Because you are the church. And if you don't praise him, then church is dead. If you don't praise him, amen, then you might as well just get ready to sit and hear some. If you don't magnify him, you're going to go home the same way you came. Oh, I don't know about you, but when I come to church, I don't want to go home the same way I come. I don't want to come in burdened like I, I don't want to leave burdened like I came in. I don't want to have that heaviness on me like I came in. I want it to be gone. That when I walk out the door, I'll know that God has heard my prayer. God has heard my praise. He's inhabited what I've given to him. And I know that he walks with me and talks with me. And he said, come on, I'm with you for the rest of the week. Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Matthew 24 and 12 says, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Uh, amen. We can't let a sinful world, uh, amen, allow us to become cold in the spirit uh, because of all the sinfulness that is being offered to the church. Uh, if there's ever a time we need to separate ourselves from the world uh, and the things of the world, it's the hour and that we're living in right now. 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, if any many man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. <laughs> glory, 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 glory. Ma. Ma, 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 ma. Hi. You might as well go on and praise him. God's already taken over this thing. I don't want to be an apathetic person. I don't want to be just someone going through the motions. I want to be someone that's sold out. Hey Amen. With everything in me. God, when I come to church, you're going to get my absolute best. When I come to the house of worship, I'm going to give you everything that I have. I'm going to praise you in a dance. I'm going to praise you in a shout. I'm going to praise you in a run. I'm going to praise you from my lips and my heart. I'm going to praise you with everything in me. Ephesus, you got a problem. Don't let apathy. Don't let apathy steal your victory. We got to have fervency on the platform. Hey Amen. Don't get up here and pray, sing. Don't get up here and play an instrument if you're not going to do it with everything within you. I'll tell that to all of them. They're all back working, doing other things, but I'll tell all of them. If you're going to get up here, do it with everything you got. I shared this with some of our musicians and singers, but I'm going to tell you the two things that build churches in 2016. Two things churches are growing on. And it's not so much personal evangelism. Churches come for worship and the word. Now, I'm not for entertaining. I think I made that pretty clear. But people want to come to church where worship is happening. And I'm starting to preach to my choir, so, so don't, uh, don't, don't think they're not here. They're getting it. But as a worship leader myself, and had been at Apostolic Temple, I was a worship leader for many years, amen, before I came here. And one of the things I could not stand, and I would preach to them, do not stand up here and act like a knot on a log. If you're going to be up here as a worship leader, then lead the worship. Raise your hands. Move to the Spirit. 
Amen. Praise God. However, he moves on you. When you sing, don't sing like you're a statue. But put some feeling into it. Put some emotion into it. Hallelujah. You're going to play? Play it like you own it. Play it like you mean it. We got to get out of that half in, half out. Kind. We've got to get some fervency in our worship. Amen. People are coming to churches and they want to worship God. But if we're just going through the motions, then we're losing that first love. Give us a fervency, God, to worship you with everything in us. I repent, Lord, if I have been apathetic in any way. I repent, Lord, if I've allowed the spirit of the enemy to hinder me, Lord, from giving you everything. I don't want to, to be like Ephesus, uh, Lord, to know the doctrine and to know what truth is, but to have lost my fervency in worship. That's one of the first things that kills the church is a lack of fervency in worship. The lack is fervency in the word. The second thing that grows a church is the word of God. But if a church is a worshiping church and a praising God church and a church that has the word being preached, amen, I, I'm just praying that we can understand that. Amen. I, you know, sometimes we, we, we want to do, and I know you're standing, uh, praise God if you want to, but here's the thing. Too many times we come in and we got our little set number of songs. And it's like we're afraid to sing past a certain point. I'll never forget Pastor Charles' face at your sister's funeral, Sister Waddy. I'll never forget it. Because he was trying to be mindful. And I'm back on the bass trying to keep pushing it. Because we was having some worship. We was having some praise. I mean, it was a home-going service for me. I mean, she was, hey amen, we were just having some church, in my opinion. And he's like, well, I don't, I don't know. And he turned around and said, oh, that was a pastor. She was down there shouting. I figure if somebody's wanting to shout, we might as well have church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sometimes we, we want to just stop the worshiping. God saying, would you worship me some more? Why does, you know what, I, 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 one, one thing the Lord has worked on me already in 2016 is stop being so worried about what everybody's thinking about the clock. Hallelujah. And so, Lord, okay, you're in control. Whatever you want for Peace Tabernacle, however long you want to take us, I'm going to sit back and let you be God. Amen. I'm not going to try to, amen. I know the Spirit is subject to the prophet, but God, as long as you're in it, I'm going to let it roll. Because I'm hungry for revival. And if I can get revived and you can get revived, amen, then we'll have revival. And once the church is revived, amen, then we can go out and reach the lost. They'll want to be a part. Amen. Church, people don't want to be part of churches that are dead. But if we're dead, then they don't want to be a part of our church. Hallelujah. But give me, give me a fervency, Lord. Give me a fervency to pray like I've not prayed. Give me a fervency to reach you in greater dimensions than I've ever reached you, Lord. See, I'm not talking about just a fervency for reaching the lost. I'm talking about a fervency to reach God. <laughs> we get so caught up. Quote, unquote, and I, and I, I, I want to reach the lost. You know that. But we get so caught up serving God that we forget to have a fervency for reaching God, or we have a fervency for reaching the lost, constantly reach the lost, reach the lost, but we lose our fervency to reach God. But I know this, that if I will reach God, He will reach them.
The word of God lets us know is that when we pray and seek him, then he will draw all men. Brother Newsom didn't come into this church because anybody witnessed to him. Brother Newsom came into this church because there was some revival going on. There was some prayer going on. There was some fervency of trying to get a hold of God going on. And when he drew by, drove by, the Lord says, that's where you need to go to church. And I am telling this church, if we can get back to that fervency that we once had, where we say, God, you're first in my life. Lord, I'm going to serve you with everything within me. Lord, I want to draw close to you. That's why people backslide. That's why people wallow in canality. It's because they have lost their first love. Amen. Or they have left their first love. And instead of seeking God with everything within them, they're seeking everything else, trying to fulfill that thing that they need in God. But when my fervency says, Lord, it's all about you. I want to fulfill your love. I want to fulfill your heartbeat. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm finished and I don't even know how to close. Here I was teaching on Ephesus. But Ephesus, you have a, a love for truth, but the thing you have lost is your fervency for me. And Peace Tabernacle, if God is speaking to me about our church and how it, 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 the application, it, it applies. For, we've got to get fervent for the things of God. More fervent than the things of the world. Eternity's at stake, and who will call on the name of the Lord? Pastor, why are you constantly telling us about different sites on YouTube? We can go watch preaching. Because you may be struggling in the middle of the week. I'm going to you to go somewhere where you can get some preaching. I love finding the old time preachers because, amen, there's just something about summertime. The things they say that just get you to line up and live right. Because I, as your pastor, know, amen, I can go to one of them messages that, that was preached 20 years ago, and I can listen to it again, and it hits me home again like it did when I was a young man. It reminds me of where I've come from and where I want to go. Lord, baptize us with fervency. Baptize us. Help us, Lord, to do the first works. The first works called for an expression or action of their affection for the Lord. Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus is the best thing I've ever, ever done. Oh, falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. Us falling in love with Jesus is the best thing I've ever, ever done. Oh, Lord. Sister Mickey Mangan used to sing a song, simply went, I miss my time with you, those moments together. Those times when you'd come and talk to me, the Lord's telling somebody tonight, hey, I miss those times with you. I miss that prayer closet you used to get into. I miss my time with you. 
I want you to love me more than you love anything else. I want you to love me with all your heart. Not holding on to the things of the world, but loving me with everything. So what do we do, Peace Tabernacle? Take me back to the first works, Lord. Take me back when my expressions and my actions and my affections were only towards you. Hikaya rabasa tayala bahar.